Hey everyone, before we get started, I just want to briefly introduce myself. My name is Charles St. Louis, and I'm the Open Source Developer Community Manager at Polymath. In this video, we are going to go through the architecture of Polymath Core 2.0. The primary goal of this is to help educate internal members of Polymath, as well as help with onboarding of new developers to familiarize with our architecture before they dig in. Before I get started with the diagram you see here, I just want to go over the basics of security tokens and how they differ from utility tokens. So a security token shares many characteristics of both the fungible ERC-20 tokens and the non-fungible ERC-721 token. Security tokens are designed to represent complete or fractional ownership interest in an asset or an entity. While utility tokens have no limitations on who can send or receive the tokens, Security tokens are subject to many restrictions based on identity, jurisdiction, and asset category. So the concept of utility tokens is fairly well understood in the blockchain space. They represent access to a network where your token purchase can represent the ability to buy or use a service from that network. Think of it as when you used to purchase an arcade token to use a game or watch a video or even claim a reward. On the other hand, security tokens represent complete or fractional ownership in an asset such as shares in a company, a real estate asset, or even a piece of artwork. Having a stake in a company, real estate, or intellectual property can all be represented by security tokens. Security tokens offer the benefit of bringing significant transparency over traditional paper shares, additionally adding functionality to their control. Security token structure, distribution, or changes that could affect investors are now all accessible through the blockchain. Security tokens and the digitalized assets they represent will form the backbone of Finance 3.0, driving innovation, adoption, and accessibility across the entire finance industry. So now let's go over to the diagram and start with the basics. Throughout the video, please follow my mouse because I'll probably be uh, highlighting where I will be speaking so you don't get too confused with the diagram. So let's start with the ST20 token. It's an Ethereum-based token implemented on top of the ERC protocol, ERC20 protocol, that adds the ability for tokens to control transfers based on specific rules. ST20 tokens rely on transfer managers to determine the rule set of tokens should they apply in order to deny or accept a transfer, be it in between an issuer and their investor, a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, or a transaction with an exchange. So basically we have a base token that gives the user the ability to add functionality through modules. Before I get into the modules, I just want to give a brief example. Like I briefly mentioned before, we have modules that can deal with transfer management. Restriction transfers through a whitelist. I'll touch base on the whitelist a little later, but essentially it's a list of approved investors that um, have the ability to purchase your token when you start your sale. So restricting transfers through a whitelist or just restricting transfer between addresses that can make an account go over a specified limit, or you can create a limit amount of token holders. You can even allow or limit transfers to prevent dumping of tokens by having a lockup period for token holders so that they don't get rid of all their tokens immediately during the sale or after the sale, sorry. So now I'm going to talk about the modules to the right right here. So there's different modules that can be attached to your security token. Think of it as customizing your security token for your use case. To begin, I'm going to talk about the transfer manager module that I briefly just mentioned. But essentially, these control the logic behind transfers and how they are allowed to or disallowed. By default, the ST20 token gets a general transfer manager module attached to it in order to determine if transfers should be allowed based on a whitelist approach. So the whitelist approach is related to KYC. So essentially, you have a list of all approved investors who have gone through your KYC process through your provider. and have the ability to invest in your sale once you start it. The general transfer manager behaves differently depending on who is trying to transfer tokens. 
So there's a couple different areas that this could work. In an offering setting, where investor is buying tokens from the issuer, the investor's address would be present on the internal whitelist managed by the issuer within the general transfer manager. Another example is in a peer-to-peer -peer transfer. Restrictions apply based on real-life lockups that are enforced on the blockchain. For example, if a particular holder has a one-year sale restriction for the token, the transaction will fail until that one-year line passes. Next, there's the security token offering module. So a security token module can be attached to only one and one STO module. That will dictate the logic of how these tokens will be sold and distributed during your sale. An STO is equivalent to the crowd sale contracts often found in present traditional ICOs. So I'm not sure if you guys have dug too much into ICOs, but there are different types, such as um, auction style, reverse auction, um, and just general sales pegged at a certain price. So as you can see to the right here, we have different types of STOs that you can go for. In the 2.0 release, we'll be working on a tiered USD STO, which is pegged to a specific uh, fiat currency, mainly USD. I'll touch base on that later a little more. For now, I'm going to talk about the permission module. These modules manage permissions on different aspects of the issuance process. The issuer can use this module to manage permissions and designate administrators on his token. For example, the issuer might give a KYC firm permissions to add investors to a whitelist. Now it's not listed here, but I'm also going to cover uh, checkpoint modules. The checkpoint modules allow the issuer to define checkpoints at which token balances and the token supply of a token can be consistently queried. This functionality is useful for dividend payment mechanisms and on the blockchain governance, both of which need to be able to determine token balances consistently at a specific point in time. At Polymath, like I mentioned before, we are shifting towards the USD tiered STO that is pegged to fiat, which allows issuers to sell tokens in different tiers and to have all the prices denominated in fiat. Before continuing with the diagram, I want to take a brief second to introduce and mention our proposed EIP for security token standard. So we proposed the ERC20, uh, ERC1400 sorry, standard a couple months back, and it was pretty much a security token standard uh, that we ended up getting community feedback to turn into two different EIPs. One, the security token, uh, which is um, they're both labeled on 1410 and 1411. So security token standard and a partially fungible token. So the partially fungible token pretty much goes off of what I mentioned earlier in that you have fractal, fractional ownership of an asset, but also has utility function for voting or claiming dividends. So a brief simple summary is it's a standard interface for issuing security tokens so you can manage the, your ownership and transfer restrictions. The security token standard builds on the partially fungible token standard, like I mentioned, to provide additional functionality to manage different types of ownership of fungible tokens representing asset ownership. This standard can also be optionally extended to implement ERC-777 and ERC-20 for backwards compatibility in the 1410 So the motivation behind proposing this standard is to accelerate the issuance and management of securities on the Ethereum blockchain by specifying a standard interface through which security tokens can be operated on and interrogated by all relevant parties. Security tokens differ materially from other token use cases with more complex interactions between off-chain and on-chain actors and considerable regulatory scrutiny. Security tokens should be able to represent any asset class be issued and managed across any jurisdiction, and comply with associated regulatory restrictions. Please note that our system is not currently compatible with this new standard we proposed. We are waiting for it to get the green light from the Ethereum community before implementing it internally. Okay, back to the architecture diagram. To reiterate, we have a security token right here, SD20, which is ERC and is backwards compatible. On top of that, we have added the ability to add on different modules. 
Think of this as customizing your STO based on your specific needs and wants, or use case, which essentially just adds functionality to your token. Going back, the way the whole Polymath network works is we have a Polymath registry, way over here, which keeps a reference of the addresses of all the other registries. These other registries are right here. So the module registry, the features registry, the security token registry, which includes the ticker registry of your token. Um, let me just go over those right now. I'm going to start with the security token registry. So this registry tells us which tokens and tickers have been registered to it. This allows us to prevent people from reserving the same ticker as another issuer and make sure it's maximum 10 characters and it also checks to see if the expiry date on that ticker is close to running up or whatever time it's at. Right now, if you reserve a ticker, it lasts for 60 days. But when it expires, someone else can go ahead and reserve that ticker unless you want to go in and re-reserve it. So the SCR registry checks for all these types of things. As we move closer to deploying 2.0 release, we are building it so when you deploy a token, you do it through the security token registry and it keeps a record of which tokens have been registered within it. Now for the module registry. This registry keeps a record of all the different module factories we have. To be clear, each module has its own factory, which is in charge of deploying an instance of that module for the issuer's token. So we have general factories, which every token uses, if wanted. But essentially, the token goes to that factory and asks for an instance of that said module. And the token will add an instance of that said module to the token, and the token will add an instance of that module to itself. A little confusing, but this makes it so that each token has its unique modules associated with it, and these are created through the factories, and the module registry keeps a records of all the different module factories that have registered within it. So as of now, Polymath is the only one that can add or register a module factory to the module registry. So for now, it's only Polymath that can submit modules to the registry. However, we're exploring different approaches to open source development to open it up to other parties, such as potentially working with external developers to provide services to issuers through modules. So overall, we have three main registries, the security token registry, the features registry, and the module registry. I have yet to talk about the features registry, so I'm going to take a minute to say what that is. The feature registry is a registry of features, clearly, <laughs> that we may enable in the future, but currently we're not going to do that as we're the only ones who control them because we don't want issuers using them. We can easily turn on access or turn it off at any time. The holds the addresses of the three types of registries I mentioned above. So the DAP team only really needs to know the address of the Polymath registry because you can access all the other ones through it. To reiterate, the ERC20 token, you have a transfer function, or a transfer from function, and on that function you would just go and transfer the desired tokens that you enter and send it to the address. So how does it work when someone calls transfer on the ERC20 token? Well, we need to verify before allowing it, so we loop through all the transfer managers to check if they are valid, and then if they are, we approve the transfer and go through and send it. As of the 2.0 release, we will have a module and security token registry which has upgradability. This means that down the road, if there's something in the logic that we need to change, we can do that without having to redeploy the whole thing again. All we need to do is update it. There's one caveat with this upgradability, and it's that it's harder to read the data associated to it. So this is because we have the security token registry and the security token registry proxy. So the proxy is the place where the data is stored, and the security token registry is a place that holds the logic for it. The logic code can be seen, but the data side can't show its logic. It can only show the methods to store and retrieve its data, such as the ticker expiry info. So that kind of wraps up everything about the architecture. I'm just going to go over it all briefly, uh, in case there's any confusion. So we have the base ST20 token, which allows for 
added functionality by adding uh, these different types of modules to it. So you're pretty much customizing your base token uh, if you want to have specific transfer restrictions, so if you don't want your users to send tokens uh, right after the sale, if you want to have a certain time limit on that, a certain volume that they can sell at a time. Um, in the future we'll be working with dividends, so you can um, add a dividends module to it so you can give dividends to your security token holders and many more. And I just want to reiterate that with the security token offering module, you can only ever choose one. And you can never go back on it once you've started your sale. And new to the new 2.0 release, we have the USD tiered STO, which is uh, essentially fiat denominated. So all your uh, sale would essentially be pegged to the US dollar or whatever fiat you would choose. Other than that, we have the uh, registries over here where the modules that are created up here um, have the a certain factory that allows it to be attached to a token. It's also the security token registry, like I mentioned, um, where you register your ticker and it stores, stores all the information with respect to that. So I just want to say that if anyone has any questions, please reach out to me. Again, my name is Charles St. Louis. I'm the open source developer community manager at Polymath. Um, you can reach out to me on Slack if you're part of the team. You can also uh, make comments on our GitHub repositories. If you're an external member of the team and you're viewing this or are new to the team, feel free to reach out to us on our Gitter. Um, it's a Polymath Network lobby uh, for questions of anyone in the industry. And please submit a GitHub issue if you have any questions regarding specific repositories. Our main GitHub repository for all of this that you see right here is under the main Polymath GitHub and it's labeled Polymath Core. So please reach out to me. Again, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, please read out and uh, have a great day.